of the whole world. Romans chapter 1, verse 14, as was read, I'm just going to read it in my preacher's voice. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as in me, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just, the just shall live by faith. You know, the Bible is the most interesting book ever written. It is a book that asks us to believe in a God that we have never seen. It is a book that tells us to follow a Savior that we have never seen. It is a book that tells us to listen to the Holy Spirit through the Word whom we have never seen. And most important, it is a book that tells us to get ready for a day that is far beyond human imagination, Judgment Day. Well, how can you live in such a way? Well, you have to walk by faith. You have to live by faith. Therefore, I have simply entitled this lesson, Living by Faith. Living by faith. And by the end of this lesson, I'm hoping that we get a deep understanding on that last statement that was made in uh, verse 17. But I want to do an exegesis of this text. I'm going to have to break it up in two parts, so you got to come back to evening service to get the second half. In verse 14, Paul did his usual introduction. He got to verse 14 and said, I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians. Of course, in Roman society, Greeks would have been respected as they kind of patterned themselves after the Greeks. But the barbarians were considered unintelligent and enemy to the Romans. And of course, there would be several wars, several battles fought between those individuals. But Paul says, I'm in debt to both the, what the Romans would consider the intelligent and the unintelligent. To the wise and to the unwise. If you are highly sophisticated and educated, I'm a debtor to you. If you are considered wise or even unwise, unintelligent, don't have knowledge, don't know how to apply, Paul says, I'm a debtor to you also. The gospel does not discriminate. The gospel can be as intellectual as you want it to be, or, can, or it can be as simple as your grandma's pie. Just cut it. Just cut it and eat. However you want it, Paul said, I can give it to you any kind of way. If you need big, gigantic words, I'll give you big, gigantic words. If you need it simplified with, uh, with no kind of elaborate design, Greek words and tenses, Paul said, I can do that also because it's made to touch everybody. But I'm in debt to preach the gospel. So in verse 15, so as much as in me is with all of my being, with what I have left, Paul said, I am ready. Prothosmos, my, my spirit is forward. I'm ready to move to preach the gospel, to declare, to announce the good news or, or glad tidings. Paul has a spirit that's ready to go anywhere. He'll go to the farthest parts, the darkest parts of the world to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm ready to come to Rome. He had not been there, but I'm ready to come 
with the gospel and save many souls. But what is the gospel? What is this thing, uh, this truth that has shaken up the whole world since A.D. 33? Keep your fingers in uh, Romans and come with me to Luke 24. Luke chapter 24 and the verse is 46. Luke chapter 24 and the verse is 46. As Jesus had died, uh, he rose from the dead three days later, and now he's appearing to his followers for over a period of 40 days in Luke 24, verse 46, he says, then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary, watch this, for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So Jesus declared that it was uh, just as it was written, it was a necessity he had to suffer. He had to be beaten. He had to be nailed to a cross. It was necessary that he suffer and die from on that cross and three days later rise from the dead. But it's the reason why he had to suffer and die that we must pay attention to in verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached. In the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in it or because of it, there is repentance. You hear the truth, and you can have a change of mind and turn from the lifestyle that you have been given and that you have been living, and God is willing to remove, forgive your sins. You can have remission of sins. That is to be preached. Look, in his name, by his authority, to all nations, to all the people all over the world, but his starting point is in Jerusalem. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what Paul wrote to them concerning uh, the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the verses 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received wherein ye stand. So notice Paul, he declared the gospel, he preached the gospel, he hurled the gospel, and the Corinthians received it. They obeyed the gospel, and they are standing in the gospel. Verse 2 and following says, by which also you are saved in the gospel that they stand in. But it has a condition, the gospel does. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. So they heard the gospel that Paul preached. They received it and that they obeyed the gospel being baptized for the remission of sins, added to the Lord's church, Acts 2, 38 and 47. And they were standing in the gospel of Jesus Christ in that very moment. They were members of the body of Christ, washed in the blood. And they would, uh, they are saved and they would remain saved if they keep it in their memory. So the gospel is not a once saved, always saved. It's a you were you were saved when you now that you're standing in it, you're still saved, but you have to stay saved. You can't turn away. And you can't blame it on anyone else. You have to have it made up in your mind that you're not leaving no matter what, that you're gonna stand on what you believe, the truth of the dead, bearing resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Paul wanted to remind them, remember what you believe. You didn't, I hope you didn't come believing in uh, uh, some man just following someone who was popular in the church. I hope that you truly believe that Jesus died for you and that he rose from the dead. And let that be not only, your, the, it's not only the drawing power, it is the staying power of God. That's what's going to keep you in the truth. Back to Romans chapter 1. So Paul is ready to preach the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the good news, uh, glad tidings. In verse 
uh, 16, now Paul wants to talk about this power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is not a shameful thing. It is not a disgraceful thing. It's not a dishonorable thing. It's not something I'm trying to hide. I'm not trying to hide that I, I believe in Jesus. It's not a hidden faith. I don't feel ashamed. I don't have to hide my Bible. This is a generation where people want you to put your Bible up and put the name of Jesus up and all this death, burial, and resurrection stuff. It's unpopular. It makes people uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable, brother. When, they, when you look weird to them, when you talk about it, it's not going to go well with you. You're going to be an outcast. Paul says, so be it. Because I'm not putting the gospel away for people out in the world, for people who are living in sin, for people who are rebellious. I, I still believe and I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Look, the good news, the gospel, it is the power of God. It is the dunamis of God. It is his force. It is his strength. You want to see God flex his muscle? You really want to see how strong God is? Look at his son and look at the power of his love, how his son endured that beating. And you really want to see a, a different display of strength? Go search for the tomb and try to find the body of Jesus. He is risen from the dead. Look, that's God saying, look at that. I said, look at that. Now, I want you to do it. I raised my son from the dead, and not only is he, did he uh, raise him up from the dead, but he is risen never to die, never to die again. And not only that, but he, he put him at his right hand far above all principalities, all names above that is named in this world. There is nothing that outranks Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection is the power, is the force of God to salvation. This is how he saves people. It's through the gospel. And he rescues people, he saves people, and he saves all people, anyone, everyone who's willing to believe. To hear the gospel of Jesus Christ to entrust their life to the Lord and obey him. You'll be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. That unpopular word in this generation. It's to salvation. It's saving people from the wrath of God. He's coming. Keep that thought in mind. This gospel is God's explosive power to save all mankind, everyone who believes, for the Jews first, it went to them first, and also for the Greeks, to all mankind. Then he says this, verse 17. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Inside the gospel, in it, is something that you have to look in the scriptures to get. It has been, what's been revealed in the gospel is the righteousness of God, how to be right with God. It is revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the gospel, God took the cover off. He laid it bare. He made it known. He made it manifest how to be right with him. In the gospel, we see that we need the blood of Jesus. We need the blood that's revealed in the gospel. I needed my Lord to suffer, although painful. I needed him to suffer for me so I can have the blood that would wash me and cleanse me I needed his resurrection so that I could be just in the sight of God. And I needed the church that was bought by the blood of Jesus. And the church is each and every one of us who are members of the body of Christ. We need one another. It's revealed 
in the, in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, how to be right with him and how to stay right with him. And notice this, it is revealed from faith to faith. Now, this is why this is going to be a two-part lesson. You got to come back. It's revealed from faith to faith. Now, that phrase faith to faith, Paul interprets a scripture that he wrote by quoting another scripture. Precept upon precept, line upon line. You use one scripture to interpret another, Isaiah 28. It is re- the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it, is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, this whole thought of faith to faith is equivalent with this statement, with this scripture from Habakkuk 2.4, where it says the just shall live by faith. In the gospel, it is revealed that you live by faith. It has a starting point, it has a living point, and it has an end point. But I want to focus in on why Paul would quote Habakkuk 2.4. Because he's really trying to push a message with quoting that scripture with what he said. Come with me to Habakkuk chapter (laughs) 1. Some people say, where is it? Flip over there to my prophets. You know, and get the say of the books of the Bible, you'll, you'll run into it. Habakkuk chapter 1 and the verses 1. It's not enough just uh, to just to uh, try to break it down and say it. Let's get an understanding on why Habakkuk 2.4 went with Paul's scripture that he wrote uh, uh, from faith to faith. Habakkuk chapter 1 in the verses 1, as the great prophet Habakkuk is prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah before they go into Babylonian captivity. So he's writing before 606 BC because that is the first wave, that's the first time Nebuchadnezzar comes to take the first wave of captives. So in Habakkuk 1.1, watch what the prophet says. Now, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, a burden is indicating a judgment has been passed. It's a burden to the ones that's going to hear it, which the prophet Habakkuk, he saw it. He saw it in the vision, and he says in verse 2, now, oh Lord, he has a complaint. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear even cry out to you? This is what he's seeing in his land, violence. You will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention. uh, There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless. And justice never goes forth, for for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, uh, perverse judgment proceeds. Habakkuk has a complaint. God, why you let all these evil people get away with it? That's what he feels like. Look at he says, I'm seeing violence. I'm seeing trouble. I'm seeing plundering and violence before me. I'm seeing strife before me. I'm seeing contention arise. I'm seeing murder. I'm seeing all type of stuff. I'm seeing a bunch of evil people. Oh, that mercy. Sound like anywhere for me? I'm seeing a bunch of evil people. I'm seeing tax penitentiaries. I'm seeing people that's not afraid of you, God violence, and, and I see strife around. I see people going back and forth. And far as the law of God is powerless, why? They don't care about it. They don't care about the law of God. It doesn't move them. One good preacher would say, uh, some people don't even fear hell. They think they can survive it. Some people are so tough, some men are so tough, they think they can handle the fires of hell. So the law is powerless. Justice, forget about that. 
uh, equality, forget about all that. Wickedness surrounds the right. There are more evil people than people trying to follow God. The judgment, don't worry about fairness, things being right, things being declared right now. Perverse judgment, partiality, evil behavior. And, and Habakkuk is seeing it and it's blowing him away. But watch this. The Lord responds to Habakkuk in verse 5. He says, now Habakkuk, that's your complaint. Let me give you, let me, let me let you in on something. Look among the nations and watch. I want you to see something. Be utterly astounded for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told to you. I'm going to do something that's going to blow you away, Habakkuk. And I want you to look out among the nations because I'm about to raise, some, I'm about to raise one up and I'm about to do something that's going to shock the world. Look at verse 6. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceeds from themselves. Come back and this is what I'm going to do about the evil. I'm sending my judgment upon the southern kingdom of Judah. And my judgment will come through the Chaldeans, a.k.a. the Babylonian Empire. And you got to understand this. The Assyrian Empire, were, they were a very wicked and evil people that would do some horrible things to you. Some things I won't mention because they're children here. And here comes the Babylonians who have conquered them. So the Assyrians were bad, but the Babylonians are worse. And God says, I have raised them up. I'm empowering them, and I'm bringing them your way. Not the judge Habakkuk, but the southern kingdom of Judah. And they are bitter in a hasty nation and they're just marching and they're conquering and they're defeating and they're defeating everybody in their way. And Nebuchadnezzar doesn't care about who you are, your reputation. And God says they are terrible and dreadful. And their judgment, they're going to declare it in themselves. So I'm sending them to, I'm, I'm sending them back. This is your uh, what's going to happen to all the people that are doing evil? I'm sending my judgment upon them. Watch Habakkuk. Habakkuk is shocked. Look at verse 12. It's, this is so bad in his ears, this judgment that's coming upon the southern kingdom of Judah. In verse 12, he says, are you not from everlasting, oh my God, my holy one? Why We shall not die, oh Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, underlying judgment. You have appointed them for judgment. Oh, rock, you have marked them for correction. Don't, you can't do that. That's too bad. That kind of judgment, those evil people, you're sending them upon your people? You're going to judge just like that? Lord, you're supposed to appoint them for judgment. You're supposed to correct them. Look at verse 13. You are pure eyes to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously, underline deal treacherously, and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? God, Habakkuk had a complaint. God told him what he's going to do. My judgment is coming upon them. And keep in mind, his judgment upon the wicked is harsh. And, and Habakkuk, it's hard for him to digest this type of judgment. It's hard for him to take it in. So keep in, flip over to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand my watch. I will stand my watch and sit, sit on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me after he said these things to the Lord. Now he want to see how the Lord will respond to him. What I, what I will answer when I am corrected. When you speak to God like that, knowing there's going to be a correction. Verse 2, then the Lord answered me and said, notice this. 
we're connecting this with that statement, the just shall live by faith. Write the vision, Habakkuk. Make it plain on tablets. I want you to write it down. I told you. Now I want you to write down what you saw. That he, Underline this part, that he may run who reads it. Why would he run? Judgment is coming. Get out of the way. You better run to God and humble yourself because Babylon is coming. The judgment is on the way. It's not going to. Nobody can hinder it. Nobody can stop it. They are coming. So when you read what Habakkuk wrote, you need to run. You need to humble yourself before God. This is real. This is going to happen. Watch how he says in verse 3, for the vision, what Habakkuk saw is yet for an appointed time. It's a time that I'm going to send him. You know, it's not yet. But at the end, it will speak. Give it time. It's going to come. It will not lie, though it tarries. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. You know, some people will be saying, well, when is it going to happen? I said, just wait for it. Just wait. Just wait. It's for a time. But when it's time, it won't tarry. It'll just happen. What will happen? His judgment upon that nation. Starting to sink in a little bit. Watch this. But at the end it will speak, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely, it will surely come. I know this is hard to believe, but it's going to happen when it's time, and it was without a shadow of a doubt. It will come, and it will not tarry. They will be swift. In verse 4, behold the proud. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was proud. You had all these proud people. Uh, we call it the big head, puffed up, thinking too highly of itself. His soul is not upright in him. But watch this. But the just shall live by faith. Now, how does that connect? But what Paul was saying, he quoted, that's the scripture he quoted. In the context of judgment, this is something you've never seen before on this level. But when you hear the word, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You will obey God, although you've never seen nothing like this. The just, those who are innocent in the sight of God who obey his word, they will live by faith. They will believe what has been written, and they will obey God. Why? Because you don't want to fall into the hands of a righteous God. You don't want to fall into the judgment of God and be condemned for all eternity in our context. Habakkuk, in that time, the just shall live by faith. Those who are obeying God at that time, they will keep his word, and they will escape being slaughtered. Now, how does this connect with us? Because in our time, the, when you obey the gospel, you obeyed it by faith. Now you must live by faith. Why? To escape the judgment. You and I will be judged. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you want to remain innocent in the sight of God, if you want to make it to heaven, you're going to have to live by faith. Look, you've never seen God. You've never seen Jesus. You've never seen the spirit who has revealed unto us the word of God, but you must obey. You've never seen uh, uh, anybody come down on a cloud. You, you've never seen a, a, a king uh, come with angelic beings, but you better believe it because he's coming. He's coming. And what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the verses 10? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that, watch this, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You're going to be judged. You know, I was in the car with a young lady in Florida. We was with their family, my wife and I, and somebody like kind of ran on out, kind of ran the uh, red light, and that little girl said, 
he's doing that because he don't know that he's going to be judged. And I told my wife, did you hear what she said? But she was so right. Do you know what's coming? Do you know that Jesus is coming back to judge the entire world? that every human being there ever was will stand before him. And judgment won't be on this earth. It's going to be in his realm. And it's not going to be on your time watch. It's going to be on his. And he won't care about your, your background, your culture, your financial status, where you live. None of that will matter. The only thing that will matter is did you obey the gospel and did you remain in the gospel? Did you, did you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? And did you remain a faithful Christian? Nothing else matters. But how are you going to, if you are a child of God, and you know that the judgment is coming, and the Lord has revealed this in the gospel, how are you going to live on this earth in order to stay faith, in order to stay saved? You're going to live by faith. Because the just... Those who are innocent in the sight of God, according to his word, they have been declared right according to God and his according to the word of God, which he has written concerning the gospel. You have been declared innocent in the sight of God. Therefore, you know, the judgment is coming. How do you live? You better live by faith. Preachers better live by faith. All preachers will stand before the judgment. All elders will stand before the judgment. All ministers and elders and deacons and members, uh, young and old, will stand before the Lord. And Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.11. The reason why he said, I'm, I'm telling y'all about the judgment, about the coming of the Lord, he says in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Remember how Habakkuk was shocked. You can't do this. You can't do this. It's too bad. Brothers and sisters, hell is so terrible. And God is so, he's so upset with all the sin that his judgment is worse than what, what happened with the southern kingdom of Judah. His judgment is hell for all eternity. It is a terror to fall into the hands of a God that is full of vengeance. And came up. you better live by faith because he's coming. And he's coming to judge the world. You know why you better obey the gospel? Yeah, God is love. Yeah, he's love. Yeah, he's merciful. Of course he's merciful. Yeah, he's gracious. Of course he's gracious. But if you don't obey, he'll send you to hell. Ooh, that's such a bad word. I know. Habakkuk would agree with you. He would say, Lord, how are you going to do something like this? Because they're so evil. It was created for Satan and his angels, but God said, now I'm going to put some people in it. But the just shall live by faith. Brothers and sisters, we must remain in the gospel in order to escape the judgment of God. And that on that great day, you and I will not be cast into a devil's hell. But you know, if you, if you are a child of God and you haven't been living right, the time is now to get right with him. You see, you don't have to go. You can restore yourself simply as John said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. First John 1, 9 and 10. As a member of the body of Christ, when you sin, God said, if you confess your sin, he is a trustworthy God. He would do his part in removing your sin. But you have to be honest with him. God is love. He, look, he is willing to give you another chance, but you have to humble yourself and make a confession. Remember, it's your soul. This is your soul, and, and, and no one will stand before God for you. And if you're not a member of the Lord's church, and you just heard how the Lord died for your sins according to the Scriptures, 
and he rose again the third day according to the scripture, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Because James, James 4 lets us know that God has not promised us another day. Your life is like a vapor. And many people, when you turn around, you're reading about this person passed away, this person passed away, this person passed away, but you don't have to go out the wrong way. It's this simple. You hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. You believe the gospel, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you believe it, you must repent. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, nay, unless you repent, you shall all, all likewise perish. Now that you have heard the gospel, are you ready to have a change of mind and say, I'm done with sin. I'm not going to hell. I can't go out like this. I have to obey him. If you're willing to have that change of mind, you must confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And if you're willing to confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, then you must be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the removal of your sin. What separates us from God? Sin. How is sin removed? When you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, being baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Today is the day where you can have your sins removed. We don't know when God is going to send his son to judge the world. But if it happens tonight, you can be saved. It's your soul. But your sins have to be removed. And once your sins are removed, the Lord will add you to the church, Acts 2, 47. Praising God and having faith with all the people in the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. That is the church of Christ that the Lord promised to establish in Matthew 16, 18. We said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The word my is a possessive pronoun showing ownership, which means the church belonged to Christ. Therefore, the Lord added to the church of Christ. Once you're added to the church of Christ, you must live by faith. You must be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The just shall live by faith. Those who have been declared righteous by God because they obey him will live by faith. But if you're not a child of God, will you decide to live for him today? Look, I, I, I know we got 30 minuters, so you got your 30 minutes. But there may be someone here, you're not a child of God, and I want to let you know that I'm not here as an entertainer. I'm not, I don't, I don't know how to be an entertainer, but I, I care for your soul, and God cares for your soul, and it is his will that you obey the gospel and be saved. And you can come forward this morning, and we'll take your confession. Look, we have the water ready. We have garments for you to put on. We have everything you need in order for you to obey the gospel. But the choice is yours. But if you will make that choice today, we'll baptize you for the remission of your sins. If you desire it, please, please come forward as we stand in that. Something more.